Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football mailbag. It's mailbag day. I'm here with Nick Filato. We're on the YouTube. We're on the podcast, wherever you want to hear us. It's fun. There's a lot of good questions in today's mailbag, Nick. So I'm very excited to get into some of these bad boys. Uh, let's do what we've been doing lately. Let's just kick right into this and let's dive right in. So we'll start with Porky Vibes, who asks, are you guys still holding out some hope that we can see Kenny Galladay production when he gets healthy? Porky Vibes, by the way, that's a pretty funny name. And I'm not 100% certain exactly where it comes from. Is it the movie Porky? That's kind of creepy looking back on it a little bit. Or is it some <laughs> other kind of name? Anyways, in terms of Kenny Galladay, I'm not necessarily holding out hope for a ton of production. Can he come in here and be a competent wide receiver and just be something that is a lot less than the contract that he is being paid right now? I think that's plausible. Yes, but I'm not looking. I'm not looking. To, I don't think he's going to be a wide receiver that demands or should deserve to be paid $70 million, unfortunately. Yeah, I think that's fair. I don't think we're getting a wide receiver one at any point in this contract. I think from what we've seen, there is probably a large enough sample size at this point to say the hip surgery has changed who he is as an athlete. Uh, I just don't see any other way to look at this. But on the flip side of that, he had the hip surgery before his first season with the Giants last year, and he had some flashes. That New Orleans game, he looked pretty damn good. So it's like, can he get back to that level of player? I, it's possible because, again, that was post-surgery. Then again, there was news that he had another surgery this past offseason, like a cleanup, which you never want to hear back-to-back -back seasons with surgeries. Uh, and now he's injured again. I'm holding out hope, though. I got to be honest with you. I need something. I need some <laughs> glimmer of hope with this wide receiver core after giving up Tony because I was watching some film earlier today, and Tony – even on those two, like the trick play with Tony, where he's supposed to pass the ball and then turn like a four yard loss into a six yard gain. It's just like there was so much upside. There was so much meat on the bone. And, and that, that was the big piece for me for the Giants in the second half. Like, how did this team take another step in the second half? Where's the boost? The boost was Tony. That was the big boost piece. Now, Ojolari could maybe be that as well, but it's not going to be the same. I don't think. I think Tony's impact could have been greater. So maybe Galladay can give him like 30% of that by just doing a better job of getting open. Um, by creating plays in the red zone that they wouldn't have gotten otherwise with catches. Like, you know, you throw that fade ball one-on-one -on -one to Slayton or you throw that fade ball one-on-one -on -one to Tony uh, from a couple of weeks ago. Maybe Slayton is, I mean, I'm sorry, maybe Tony is the one who comes down with it for a touchdown. Who knows? Potentially. Or, so or I Galladay. Have a or yeah, Galladay. Probably, not Tony. Not yeah, Tony. yeah. I, get I, I got it. You know, when you were watching Kadarius Tony, were you just listening to Sarah McLaughlin and just being like, <laughs> I will remember you? Yeah. There's nothing <laughs> to remember. That's the problem. The Tony Eric no, right? Right? just like he was injured for most of it. He was awesome when he was on the field. He has incredible upside. He's young. But something weird happened there. Like, this is not the 2017 Giants where Ben McAdoo benched Eli Manning during an Ironman streak and literally lost the locker room for that decision. This is a good locker room. They've been winning football games, and Tony still found a way to, you know, alienate himself either from the locker room or from his coaches and his regime. And I will say this on the Tony front. I think I mentioned this on a podcast a few months ago to you, Nick, or I might have just said it off pod, but I'm okay saying it now. I've had literally two separate people tell me in the DMs, and one person who I'm friends with, that Tony was wearing him wearing out his welcome in that locker room. And it was so it wasn't just the regime. From what I heard, everyone was all this is from uh someone I, I don't want to reveal, but it's somebody who's no who's friends with somebody on the team, um, a brother of somebody on the team. And everyone else was all bought in to what they were preaching. And and Tony was apparently not. And so that obviously meant something, I think, in all of this. So it is what it is. As far as Galladay goes, though, hopefully they can get something. Yeah, I think that was off pod that we mentioned that. And I think it was a, a good point. And now looking back on it, I think it rings true after everything has kind of developed now. Greg Chiola asks, what's the best way for a defense to align or execute to stop a zone read? Feels like the offense always has the advantage on this play as long as the quarterback makes the right choice. Yeah, I was just listening to a coach break this down last night about how difficult of a time they have stopping zone read and teams that run a lot of zone read and now you're seeing a lot of nfl teams use zone read use rpos built in off the zone read um it is really difficult you should have an extra man advantage on offense if you execute it right i'm trying to think of the best way to stop zone read. i guess what, what would you say is the best I'll, I'll ask you nick i think you're probably the better resource for this well first off a lot of zone read games are starting to 
incorporate RPO tags on them, which is really making it difficult on the right. defense because you have to pay attention to those slant routes and those glance routes and things like that. But I think a good way to defend it, and we saw the Giants do this late in the third quarter or maybe been early in the fourth quarter against the Ravens and then the zone read game stopped burning them, is you take the read defender and you pinch him directly at the mesh point. And then you take the linebacker to that side and you scrape him over the top to replace that edge. Now he has gotcha. contained. So the quarterback is going to read that end man on the line of scrimmage pinching. And he's going to be like, oh, crap, he's pinching. I'm going to keep the football. Now Lamar Jackson or whomever keeps it. And then there's a linebacker right in his face playing contain. It's just called that know, linebacker then also lane. scraping into the passing lane as well. Essentially, he's also. Um, no, that's the lane. issue with it, though, because yeah, a lot of the times he's right. going to scrape over. And, you know, you're reading, say, Jihad Ward on that one play. You're reading Jihad Ward and say if there was an RPO tag, but you can still see Jalen Smith scraping over the top. And if you see him scrape over the top and take himself out of that throwing window, you're just going to throw the RPO there. So all right. that wide receiver has to do is beat that cornerback inside. So that's why a lot of defenses are ripping their hair out, trying to figure out a way to defend this. Order. There's there are other ways to defend it. That way is something that I feel like has worked for the Giants, at least when they were really getting burned by it against Baltimore, which was the primary game. I think they saw zone read. And there are a lot of people with a lot of good resources on how to defend the RPO, the zone read and things of that nature. But mainly it just comes down to discipline from, from defenders because one thing you can't have right. is basically what the Giants offense has benefited from the entire season. And that's just the defense not respecting the quarterback for whatever reason. It has to come a point where these these defenders start respecting Daniel Jones because Daniel Jones is a freaking great athlete, dude. And there have been so many of these teams who are pinching and they're not replacing. So Daniel Jones is running for like 20 yards off of that. And that right. just is unacceptable. Yeah, it's interesting, especially when you factor in that you also have that glance route or that whatever you want to call it, that in-breaking RPO tags, so and then it makes it really hard. You got to have maybe your defenders like tuned in to get their hands up so they can hit, you know, bat down quick game. That could give you an advantage with the defenders like not used on the yeah. like to pinch down and to focus on the run. It's tough though, and that's why so many teams are using it. So many of the good teams. That's why the Giants are finding a lot of success on their offense using it. You know, with Daniel Jones because it makes a lot of sense. So, great question. Fun to go into that one. Let's see. Keelan asks, with Fabian Ramo Moreau playing well, when Aaron Robinson comes back from injury, do you think the team would consider moving him back to the slot where he played in college? I think it's up in the air for sure. I mean, Fabian Moreau is playing some good football right now, and he's not flawless or anything. I don't know why you wouldn't entertain putting Aaron Robinson back there unless he has absolutely no work in this specific defense operating in the mm -hmm. slot, and it would be too much for him to kind of learn right now. That could be something that could hold him back, and now you just have an extra outside cornerback. But even so, though, like, I, you see a Dory Jackson and a lot of players kind of cycling in and out of the slot when they're following number one receivers. So I think it's mm -hmm. something that we could see, especially for a defense that loves to run you know, quarter and dime and a lot of these defensive back looks. You want to get Fabian Moreau and Aaron Robinson on the football field at the same time in those looks when Aaron Robinson is back. And there's only two outside spots. So I think it might be something in the nickel package that we could see because Darnay Holmes has, like most of his career, has kind of been up and down this season. Yeah, I think this is a, it's a great question, Keelan. And I think it's a really interesting idea because if I had to look at the Giants' corners right now, Dory Jackson, Fabian Moreau, Darnay Holmes, by far and away, the biggest liability right now is Darnay Holmes. And it's not even close. Darnay Holmes versus Adoree Jackson right now. I'm sorry, versus obviously Adoree. We pencil that one in. But even Darnay Holmes versus Fabian Moreau, production-wise, is not close right now. Now, caveat, and you have to be fair, it is so much more difficult to defend in the slot than it is to defend on the outside. And it's not even close. So there's no guarantee that if they move someone else in on the slot, he won't struggle as well. But with that said, I feel com more comfortable potentially right now with a combination of Moreau on the outside and Aaron Robinson in the slot or even Cordell Flott if he's not given an opportunity in the slot over Darnay Holmes in the slot and Aaron Robinson on the outside, right? Or Darnay Holmes in the slot and Flott on the outside. So I think the best combo might actually be Moreau, Robinson, and Adoree once Robinson comes back with Robinson in the slot. And you got to get your best combination of players on the field. Now, what Nick said is true, of course. Robinson doesn't have the experience right now in the slot. Holmes does. But I haven't loved what I've seen at all from Holmes in the slot this season. No, neither have I. I think this is a, a good issue to have because none of us expected Fabian Moreau to be as, right. I think, adept as he's played so far this season. So now you just look at Darnay Holmes, who's who's fine. He's not, he's not terrible. Yeah. He's not a bad starter, right. but he's probably a player you want to replace over. So if you get Aaron Robinson back and Moreau can can 
continue to play the way he's played, now you get an upgrade at the slot. And then you incorporate Cordell Flott back into the mix eventually. And now you get an upgrade in your dime package. So that's kind of the hope right now. And again, you can put Darnay Holmes out there. Not a liability. Just right. it's going to have, you know, three plays a game where you're like, uh, but then he has some of those plays like he had against Green Bay, like he had last week where he's that blitzer and he's a very smart player and he sees that guy flaring out into the flat wide open. And what does he do? He curls off his blitz and he takes that guy. He's had two big plays this season doing that. So I do appreciate his processing. For sure. The, to be fair on both sides of it, obviously, he was the main man responsible for that big Travis Etienne 47 yard run last week as well. Oh my so God. Yes, he was. Yeah. So yes, he there's was. This, you got to take the good with the bad. So, um, okay, great, great string of questions to start this off. Um, so we don't even filter these most of the time. So this is great. Uh, we got giants news 56 asked with the bye week coming up. If you were an NFL player, he says single guy with, with no kids making millions. How would you spend your week off? <laughs> How would I spend my week off? I don't know because I feel like there are two sides. I don't know if I'd want to travel, especially since I'm yeah. traveling so much in season. I don't know if I'd want to go to go to the Bahamas. I might just hang out, say, if I'm on the Giants in North Jersey and, and maybe, you know, just relax. I, I think that's what I would do and take care of my body. And that sounds really boring. I would go out and, and travel the world during the offseason. I would full on Leonard Williams during the offseason. But in season, even during the bye week, I don't think I would travel. Now, I'll tell you one thing I wouldn't do, Nick. You know what that is? Travel? I wouldn't go down to Miami and get on a boat. That's the one thing I wouldn't do. <laughs> 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 but uh, as far as what I would do, um, yeah, I mean, look, I would do the same thing as Nick. I would just recover, heal, sleep a whole lot because sleep is insanely important to your recovery. Do all that like pay. If I was an athlete, man, I would spend so much. I would be a LeBron type athlete. I would spend so much money on body recovery. I'd be wasting mm -hmm. mil I'd be wasting all my money essentially on body recovery. It's like stretching, the cold tubs, the massage, like all that stuff that you got to do to keep your body right, especially in a sport like football. But yeah, I don't think it's enough time. And I, I think there's a chance that, you know, if you do something like that, there's issues with like travel. What happens if you get stuck in a country or something like that? Jamie old Jamie Gillen style. Um, so yeah. <laughs> poor, poor punter. But Chris no longer in St. Pete asks. What do you think the NFL would look like if they ditched the salary cap? Do you think it would resemble MLB? Where would you see the Giants spending? Like the Yankees, or would they be a little less aggressive? This is a great question. I love this question. I think if the NFL ditched the salary cap, the Giants would be in a, a really good position. I'll tell you that. So a lot of people bash John Mara. I've never fully got it. Okay, one thing I will give you. He, he made a really poor decision sticking with Gettleman for that long. That was obvious that that needed to be cut off at its head two years at max into the Gettleman regime. And it was only getting worse and worse. There was no like, there was no, you know, things are going to get better at that point in my mind. And I think it was pretty clear. But outside of the Gettleman stuff and the Josh Brown situation, which I something I also did not appreciate from John Mara. He's been a good owner for the Giants. You know, people don't want to admit it or agree to it, but he spends all the time to the cap. He never tries to cheap out and save money like some of these owners do as far as spending goes. And he does put a lot of resources into coaching, right? He's fired two coaches after giving them multi-year contracts, knowing he has to pay off the rest of those contracts because coaching contracts are guaranteed. And he doesn't care. He's willing to continue to move and cycle in different guys to give them. It's like a, it's like getting an extra chance at a quarterback every year in the draft. He just keeps taking those swings at coaches. And look, he finally hit on one. And if he waited another year with Judge, he wouldn't have. Uh, Dable would have been gone. So I give him more credit than others. And I think if there was no cap, Nick, we would be one of these insano spending teams. There'd be like five teams that can spend the Giants, maybe the Jets. Nah, the Jets owner's cheap. It'd be like the Giants. Dallas. I don't even know. Dallas, obviously. Dallas would have the biggest yeah. edge of all. Dallas would be the Dodgers. <laughs> so the Cowboys would be the Dodgers right now, 100%. Yeah. But like even more exaggerated version of the Dodgers because there wouldn't be a Mets. There wouldn't be a Steve Cohen like pushing the Dodgers like he is. So really, the Do the Cowboys would be insanely good because they'd just be spending like crazy. The Giants yeah, would Pitt be one of the spenders. Who else? Pitts Pittsburgh probably would be as well. Maybe. I feel like Pittsburgh, maybe, but um, they've done a lot of good because they have made a lot of money as a franchise. So hopefully they would be, too. But they've kind of benefited from the salary cap error. The Ravens, a team that really dominates in the salary cap error, might not be as good because they don't I don't know if they would be as big spenders. It's hard to know. I'd have to look into the finances of a lot of these owners, to be completely honest with you. Chris. I'll tell you the one the one yeah. team, Dan, that would that would just be the shittiest team in the league would be the Bengals. <laughs> oh, the Bengals would be absolutely terrible. Mike Brown is so cheap. 
<laughs> yes, it's not like spending money. Shad Khan, look, the Jags could easily like pop on. The Jags would be like a Man City type situation if they, if the, uh, if, <laughs> if the NFL didn't have salary cap. And I didn't mean it like that at all. Just because Shad Khan is like a big spender and would be willing to like fire out money. Look at what he did. He he hired Urban Meyer to an insane contract, fired him within the first year, ate up all that money. Um, he's done decisions. He's, you know, he's done things like that. He spent big in free agency. So Shad Khan and and the Jags come to mind as like a surprise team that would be like a perennial winner. Absolutely. And then I think the Raiders would be spenders. I think Davis would probably yeah. be spending a lot of money. Yeah, I could see that too. Definitely. Sal asks, DJ, two to three year quarterback deals basically never work out because they're usually given to guys you'll not, you're not sold on and tend to eat up a lot of cap in the early years. Considering the history of these types of contracts, wouldn't the wise thing be to either go all in on a quarterback, a five to six year deal, or just say thanks and walk away? It's an interesting question, Sal. And he says re regarding Daniel Jones. Um, so the idea of going all in on a five or six year deal being better than the two year, a two to three year deal. That's the part I don't know if I fully understand the, the logic behind, because if you're giving the five to six year deal, and that includes a lot more guaranteed money, because it would have to than a two to three year deal. How is that a wiser and safer thing? Because if that quarterback doesn't work out or if after one year or two years, things have regressed, things have trended down and you want to get rid of that quarterback, you have more guaranteed money tied to him instead of the two to three. I get the idea of it. Look, a two to three is going to allocate more cap space in the immediacy instead of the five to six where you can push some of that cap bit back. But why do you want to push a cap bit back on a quarterback that you're not sure of or that you think has a chance to potentially not take that next, next, next step? I don't see the idea behind that because you don't really it, it feels like you're just pushing the cap hit further back, at least with the two to three year deal. You get it in. You resign the guys that need to resign the Andrew Thomas of the world. But you push those cap hits back, knowing in two to three years, you'll cycle back the quarterback. Now, the upside of it, of course, is if Daniel Jones takes an even bigger step and becomes like one of these elite three quarterback, three to five quarterbacks in the NFL. Now you got a bit of a bargain with the five to six year deal versus the two to three year deal where you have to then resign him after that. And then the market has changed because the NFL is making more money, the TV deals, et cetera, et cetera. The cap has risen. That's the risk behind it. But um, I don't mind eating a lot of cap early. Like you said, uh, if it's it, to me, it's less of a risk because if things don't work out, you can get out of it easier. The last thing I would want to fall into, Sal, would be like a Jared Goff type situation or for like a running back, like a Todd Gurley type of situation where you're like, dude, this guy's cooked. He's not it. We made a mistake. Let's just eat all that dead cap, suffer now, and then we'll rejoice later when they're not on the team. But I do understand where you're coming from, and I do think that's one of the reasons why it's a very fascinating type of conversation. I think, Dan, you did a really good job kind of breaking down the pros and the cons to extending for five to six and extending two to three. And it's great situation to be in right now for the New York Giants, kind of, I would say, because we kind of just chalk this all <laughs> nice mug. We kind of just chalk this all up right now as Daniel Jones just being a uh, being a loss. Like nobody thought he was going to be here long term. Now it's at least a conversation. It doesn't mean he's going to be, but it's now at least a conversation. It gives the Giants a little bit more options heading into the offseason. And I just flash this mug for those who know, you know. If you know, you know. it's one of those. It says I voted oh, I for Clay don't Davis. Know. I actually don't know. Where's that from? You, you definitely don't know this one, this Clay Davis reference. But, you know, there is actually a follower who is Clay Davis of ours on Twitter. I don't know if you've interacted with him. He, he no, yeah, I have. Him. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, Clay Davis. She. That's all I'm going to say about that. All right. We got Jonathan who asks, what's your favorite Seinfeld episode ever? It's a great oh, one. Oh, it's the wire. Clay Davis is a wire thing. Okay. Yeah, Clay Davis is a wire character. Yeah, yeah. I would have never... Yeah, I was just like, oh, man, he likes this mug. Nice mug, but all right. <laughs> what is my favorite episode of the sign? I mean, dude, there are so many, and I'll bounce back and forth. I'm so fickle with these types of like favorite episodes for shows that I actually love. Yeah. I think one that really just kind of jumps out to me, and Dan can attest to this. I'll text Dan randomly and just be like, bro, I just watched this episode. It's the best. So I'm really yeah. flip-floppy with this, but the shrinkage episode is is... <laughs> It's just great, dude. It's just great. What do you mean, laundry? Like, it, there are so many like little parts of that episode that I feel like men would appreciate, and not just men. Like, obviously, women too. But like, it is a little bit more geared towards men because of shrinkage and stuff like that. And every time I watch that episode and Elaine in that episode and how innocent she is with <laughs> some of the questions, I just laugh my ass off. That's a great call. 
there's so many options. I'll start with, I'll just write, write off a few that come to mind that are in like the mix for me. I'll start with the marine biologist, just oh, so yeah. excellent with George trying to pretend to be a marine biologist and then having to like get caught up on it and like, oh, you got to prove it. There's an actual whale dying on the beach. So that's just excellent stuff. Any of those types of situation with George always make me laugh. The parking garage is a classic episode. I would say that that should be in there as well. The contest, definitely one of my favorites. I don't care that it's like everyone's favorite. It's just such a brilliant idea. Like they brought that to TV in, in what, the late 90s, early, like whenever that was. That was unexpected at the time. And I thought it was excellent. Those three would come to mind. I'm trying to look through to see if anything else like stands out too much to me. The contest those, was actually early 90s too. Yeah, so like yeah, a little bit. Right. Yeah. The big salad, the big salad's definitely up there for me. You had to have the big salad. Just just awesome one. The, and also the Merv Griffin show. I'm seeing that one now, just thinking about how funny yeah. that was with jo with Kramer putting up the whole set yeah. and everything. Just so good, man. The show is Yeah, so the cool. Soup Nazi's a great one. Yeah, the, uh, the chicken across the street from where Kramer lives. I don't remember the name of that episode. That's a great there there are so many, and I'll I'd go back and forth just kind of jumping around, but it's the one, one of my where Jerry goes show. down to to florida to visit his parents with elaine and elaine yeah. sleeping on like that couch that's just such an underrated amazing episode with the pen that the old the pen that jerry's father's friend Clompus. gives jerry <laughs> yeah jack clompus yeah yeah jack clompus <laughs> there's so many great set cut side guys jack clompus is excellent one of the best there, there are so many uh great side and there i believe we've probably had the conversation in the past Dan, of being like who is your favorite side character in yeah. Seinfeld, you know, not the big four and maybe even exclude like the Newmans of the world. Right. And that's even something that I will like go back and forth on because there are so many like good side wow. characters. Yeah, it really is. I don't even know who I would go with there. That's a tough one. All right, let's dive back into this with a Giants question. Dynasty Goat asks, what quarterbacks that are still on their rookie contracts would you and Nick rather have than DJ right now? Keeping in mind that they get to work with this coaching staff, and may have more years left on their current rookie deals before you'd have to pay them than Jones, who is a free agent. So firstly, is Justin Herbert still on his rookie contract? Yes. So obviously Justin Herbert, Trevor Lawrence, I would say. Uh, see, this is where it gets weird. Like Lamar Jackson as a talent, I would go with, but then he's up to get paid next year. So as is Daniel Jones, but Lamar Jackson is also, you know, a more advanced quarterback, a former MVP. So I guess you would have to group Lamar Jackson in that if we're analyzing this under like the same contractual type of stipulations that Daniel Jones is with the New York Giants. So Lamar Jackson, who's still on his rookie deal, Joe Burrow. Um, and I'm sure there are probably others, but are there any others that are coming to your mind? Like so I wouldn't go with Tua right now. Like uh, I wouldn't. I don't think I would go with Tua. I don't so, think like, I would go with Tua even with this coaching staff because while I do think there are guys who can be better within this coaching staff, who I'm about to mention, Tua to me is not one of them. Tua is with the coaching staff that I think right now could maximize the potential. Yes. What you want here is not that type of quarterback. Not Tua. I mean, you want an athletic, functional quarterback. So I would say to start Lamar Jackson for sure. I think Lamar Jackson in this system would be better than Daniel Jones is in this system. I think he'd be great in this system, to be completely honest. Now, I think he's in a great system for him there in Baltimore, but I would say Lamar Jackson first comes to mind from that class. I don't now, even this think the, I don't even think Lamar Jackson and Greg Roman, like obviously that's like a marriage yeah, that we've I been know. talking about for years, but like the adjustments kind of are not there, like the adjustments yep. that Kafka and Dable make. They're just not, dude. And we saw it last yeah. night. Like it's just not there. And they they played well down and down the stretch of the game. And like a lot of that was just Lamar being Lamar and just being awesome. Yes. And I would say, like, even in this system, like, with that quick quick read to run system that Dable has right now for Daniel Jones, that could work even better for a Lamar Jackson, right? Like, you could yeah. be really stuck as a defense if you're going against Lamar running this many times. Because Greg Roman doesn't even run him that much. Design runs. Like, he runs sometimes just on his own. It would be like, damn, every single play we have to just, how do we defend this? This dude's dropping back and choosing to run so early. So, Lamar, the interesting one, as I'm working through each class, the interesting one for me right now, and it's interesting because it didn't start this way back in 2019, but now it's a question for me. It's Kyler Murray. Uh, yeah. yeah. He's because not on his rookie deal. He's not on his rookie though, but deal, but we're just going to yeah. throw him in there anyway, just for the sake okay. of this debate. Because I used to be definitely Kyler over Daniel Jones, but I've there's one thing about Kyler and Russell Wilson that bothers me, and, and this goes back to something we talked about with Danny Kelly uh, on the preview podcast for the Seahawks game. When they had Russell Wilson, Danny was saying like, the, you know, the low key thing in, C in Seahawks fandom right now that people were talking about who or you know, deep fans were talking about was, will this unlock the offense moving away? And they were talking about this last this past offseason, you know, two months ago, whatever it was. 
will this unlock the offense to move on from Russell? Because we don't use the middle of the field with Russell Wilson as a quarterback. And that's kind of the situation with Kyler too. And, you know, you can say it's scheme based, but what really stands out to me as crazy as this sounds, Nick, is it just because they're short, like short that's, quarterbacks, that's it's yeah. probably why. And like for a while there, at least at Oklahoma, Murray used the middle of the field better because it was just all like timing concepts. And like, it was just like, he just basically had to guess that the receiver, not guess, but he practiced it enough. They were on time in that offense. And he had a feeling the receiver would be at a spot, but he wasn't really reading the receiver at that spot. And Tua talked about this as well. He's another short quarterback. Um, he talked about like, get open because if, if you can't see me, try to move around because if you can't see me, I can't see you. Uh, so with these short quarterbacks, Murray, the Murray, Murray obviously fa falls into this bucket. I start to wonder if I even want to invest in a quarterback who, who has, you know, who can't really see the middle of the field because it's hard to see over your offensive line. And I lean, you know, I go back and forth on this because Murray can do a lot of interesting things. But I, I think right now, if Murray was on, still on his rookie contract with the reputation he has, because he's obviously going to have to get paid more than a Jones type if they both hit the market. I, I'm close on this. I might lean Jones at this point. I don't know if I trust these quarterbacks who can't see over the line. Um, obviously, Breeze then, was six foot and figured it out, though. So I don't know how he did it. Breeze was excellent at figuring it out. And, and Tua is a little bit bigger than Russell Wilson and yeah. and Kyler Murray. Kyler Murray, he's he's small, dude. He's small. And yeah. there are also questions about Kyler Murray and his work ethic and things like that that were always on that were on full display out here in Arizona. It was talked about all the time. And it was also talked about on ESPN. Those are not questions that you're getting from Daniel Jones at all. And another thing about Daniel Jones, and I know he doesn't get knocked for being short, obviously, but I don't know if people realize actually how freaking big he is. He's six foot five, like 225, 230 mm -hmm. pounds. Like Daniel Jones is a big guy. Like he's not going to have any issue seeing over the line of scrimmage. So I think, and you're right, man, 2019 never would have thought I would say this, but right now I do think it's a conversation for everything that you laid out so perfectly. But Joe Burrow, then, Justin Herbert, you're on. Yeah, you're on. then we got to go with the others. Burrow and Herbert, for sure, I would rather have than Jones. Are you the same page there? Of course, yeah. Now we get to a more interesting class, uh, and I think that's it for that. We said no on Tua, no on Jordan Love. Um, that's it in that class. Oh, no, it's not. Jalen Hurts, that's a really interesting one. Would you rather have that Jalen is. Hurts or, or Daniel Jones? That's, that is very interesting. And uh, I think Jalen Hurts, but you, you get an extra year. Right or two years actually, right? Uh, Jalen Hurts. So no, Jalen Hurts. Twenty twenty twenty. He was drafted. Yeah, he were, Hurts was twenty twenty, but he's only a, a the four year second. deal because he was a second round pick. Yeah. 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 So I, th I think Daniel Jones. I, I haven't studied Jalen Hurts' tape yet this season, but I'm wondering is Daniel Jones a more accurate quarterback than Jalen Hurts right now? And that's something that I, that I'm not really a hundred percent certain about. I know Jalen Hurts last year. A big reason why the Eagles just absolutely floundered in the playoffs was because Jalen Hurts couldn't make any throws over the middle of the field. He's a smaller quarterback too, but he's not like, you know, six foot. I think he's a little bit bigger than that, but he struggled throwing in the middle of the field. He wanted to target everything on the outside. And I'm not sure if that's been fully rectified. I'm imagining it's probably been upgraded with the addition of uh, AJ Brown helping you out. But Daniel Jones is done pretty well thrown over the middle of the field. So I think I would lean Jalen Hurts, and I hate to do that, but I'm just trying to be objective here because I, yeah. I think there's a lot of growth potential with Jalen Hurts, and he's another player similar to Daniel Jones who everybody in the locker room absolutely adores. They love, mm -hmm. they love to work at. I've been, a, I've been a diehard fan of Jalen Hurts since his time at Alabama when he was benched for Tua. And he sat there and he went in front of the cameras as like a 20 year old kid and had so much maturity in class talking to the media about like, hey, you know, I'm so glad we won. It's like, dude, you just got benched. That's so embarrassing. We thought he was done. And then he goes to Oklahoma and reclaims his career. And now he's a second round pick. And now he's the quarterback of the only undefeated team in the NFL. Like if he wasn't an eagle, I would love this guy, you know, but I, I think I lean uh, I think I lean Jalen. What about you? That's a great case. And I, I really like that. What you I, I've, I've read some stories and like seen some interviews too with him about that. Um, also, the dude like came to Oklahoma and he's like, I, I saw something where he's like, he, when he got to Oklahoma, he felt like, you know, he was, he didn't want to feel like he didn't want his teammates to feel like he was just given the job. And so he came out there and worked his ass off. He was like, there's like him squatting 550 or 600. <laughs> he's like, I had to prove to my teammates that I'm willing to put the work in. Um, and so you see that when he's as a runner. So the question was framed, Nick, in a way that was, you get the Giants coaching staff, right? So this is not Hurts now. This is not what Hurts is with Sirianni. This is Hurts with Dable and Kafka. And to be quite honest, Dable and Kafka, Hurts in this system that Daniel Jones is running right now 
would be freakishly good, in my opinion. Like, it could be even better than the system the Eagles are running for him because it would be a ton of read run, which is awesome for him. <laughs> He'd be even better than Jones in that regard. And it would be a ton of throw on the run, which is awesome for him. What I've seen from Hurts this year, I haven't seen his tape. What I've seen from him is he's made a lot of wow throws on the run. He's made a lot of wow throws out of structure. And like you said, he's made a lot of his wow throws outside the hashes. Now, that's the question. Can he operate within a drop back offense over the middle of the field, rhythm passing game, timing, rhythm passing? Does Dable really make do Dable and Kafka really make their quarterbacks do that? Not really. Not much. Sometimes we've seen it sometimes this year, but the vast majority has not been that kind of offense. So they wouldn't ask Hertz to do that either. So with all that said, I'm going to take Hertz because I think Hertz can make I think Hertz could operate this system better. And that's not a knock on Daniel Jones because Daniel Jones no. has done really good operating system for three games now. We spent hour we spent two hours and a half, two and a half hours. OK, well, what is that? 150 minutes breaking down Daniel Jones two days ago on film. And he looked unbelievable. And we had nothing but praise for him. We said the same about two games before. But in this system, I think Hertz could potentially be even better. Um, now I'm right the there. Time, uh, go I'm, right, I'm right. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm right there with you. But the counter argument against Hertz would be Sirianni runs a good offense as well. He wouldn't have mm -hmm. the offensive line that he's playing behind nor the weapons. So I think that's a fair counter argument. I still think I do lead Jalen Hurts, but I wanted to put that out there. That is a fair counter argument, especially because the film of Hertz last year against the Giants defense, the only film I got to see of him as far as film goes, I saw him on broadcast a bunch. He did not look good. Jones looked better. The, he, the Giants figured out a way to really stop him in those two games last year, or especially the one game against the Eagles where he threw the, the pick against the single high with McKinney. Like that play comes to mind. I was not a good throw by him or a decision. But he wouldn't be in that system anymore. He'd be, I just feel like the Dable system is even better for him. But, but I don't know. That's a, that's more of a projection than Trevor Lawrence. I, Nick said he would take Lawrence over Daniel Jones. So would I, I just bet on the traits there, especially within this system. I think Lawrence could be freakish good. Now the rest of that class is where it gets interesting, right? Yeah. I wouldn't, I would take Daniel Jones over Zach Wilson at this point on the rookie deals. Um, now he did say you have to consider that you get more years. So that's going to be a consideration with all of the following answers Nick and I have, because it's not Daniel Jones, a free agent this off season. If you take any of these quarterbacks from 2021, we have a minimum of two years and a rookie option for three more years after this one. So that factors in because when we're answering this question, Daniel Jones is going to be paid what by the Giants this year? 25, 30 million against the cap. These guys are still in the eight to 10 range for three more years after this. So keep that in mind when we say our decisions here. And I'll bring it up again because I want it to be clear uh, at some point. I would still say no on Wilson. I think Wilson was a player who has great arm talent and maybe he could do better with good coaching like the Giants, but I don't think the coaching, that kind of coaching is the issue like system. I think he needs to fix his footwork completely. I think I was fooled on him from an arm talent standpoint. I really liked him coming out just because of his arm talent, but he didn't have many of the other traits, it seems. Um, and it seems like one of the bigger issues for Wilson is he played behind such a good O-line at BYU versus the competition. And now that, contrast the Jets O-line versus the rest of the NFL defenses they've placed has not been the same and it speeds up his clock his accuracy has been horrific from the games I've watched I would not take Wilson over Jones even with the extra two years now I'll t toss it over to you then we'll work back through the others how about that yes yeah, so this is where it gets tricky because it's so valuable to have these 2020 this class is 2021 Daniel Jones was drafted in 2019 you're getting so many years of cheap True quarterback play which makes me lean towards all of these quarterbacks because i trust in kafka and dable no shot on daniel jones at all this is just economics at this point and i and i do think that there's talent with zach wilson i think they would find a way to utilize that talent justin fields there's talent there are plays that you make you want to rip your hair out when you watch justin fields but he's also an incredible athlete and i think he would have success with dable and with kafka trey lance he's hurt right now i still think they're that they would find a way to get the most out of trey lance there are accuracy issues with trey lance and there's some accuracy issues with justin fields but can those be rectified possibly but you also have so much time to figure that out so mac jones i don't know if i'm entertaining that because he can't move like like all the players that we just listed right. like zach wilson he can freaking move you know the thing i don't like about zach wilson that makes me lean daniel jones a little bit is he's small bro and he's he's a skinny dude like he, he's not big yes. like daniel jones is so i might go with daniel jones over zach wilson but in terms of justin fields and trey lance um i could go either way but i, I might lean towards the cheaper contracts yeah um, it's interesting. I would say no on Wilson. I just think he's going to be a bust, like we said. 
Mac Jones, I'm a no on as well. The movement issues there. I don't want it. I, I don't even know. They'd have to change the offense. You can't run this offense the Giants are running now with Mac Jones. That wouldn't work at all. And I don't think they have the talent right now. And it might not be for a little while now. Depends how they hit in the draft. I don't think they have the talent now, though, to find or, you know, to have the receipt to run the offense you need to to make Mac Jones successful, um, which is kind of like more of a Brady type offense for me within the pocket. Great receivers getting open early and often. Um, and great blocking, pass blocking. So no on Mac, no on Wilson. Lance is the tougher one for me. Um, I'd still say no. I think I'd still say Daniel. Uh, you get to three years, though. Uh, it's tough, Lance, because Lance could end up being nothing. Lance did not play much at, at in college. He's yeah, not I'm, had factoring, much. I'm factoring in, like, he didn't get hurt. Like, uh, with the injury, right. I'm definitely out on Lance, but I'm acting as if he never – broke his ankle in week two but i, think I don't the know ankle you can come back from potentially pretty easily i don't know though I to lose a whole year of development and experience yeah, yeah. there's a lot you lose yeah. from that that's a big problem yep so the lance one's quite quick here the fields one people aren't going to like to hear because there's this narrative that fields is horrible just because he has like so many of these like highlights of really bad throws but if you watch the tape of fields versus i don't know even watch the tape you watch the broadcast of fields versus patriots on monday night football you saw what he can be and Fields with Dable and Kafka, I think, could be like they had designed runs for him. He threw excellent on the run. He's going to have head scratching plays that Jones doesn't have. Like the misses that Fields has had from a ball placement standpoint are way worse than you'll see from Fields. So the, yeah. the lows with Fields are going to be way lower than Jones, but I think the highs are going to be higher. And I think he has a, it's, they're starting to figure some things out for him in that system, but put him with Dable and Kafka and have him operate the offense Jones has operated. I think he could be really good. Plus, you then get the extra three years of contract, obviously, as Nick has brought up. So Fields for me is a yes. I would rather have Fields. And and I would take no one from this 2022 class, I don't think, even with all the years. <laughs> yeah, Maybe I don't even it, but Probably not. No, nah, I wouldn't take Pickett. I, I yeah. don't believe. I, I don't think I'd take any of those those players. But now we have question from that was a great question by the way dynasty yeah. Go. gabble judge asks has your view of daniel jones ceiling changed do you believe that he is capable of being a top 10 quarterback if he continues to progress and has provided better weapons yeah gabble great question i think as we've said in the past or as i've said in the past and i stand by it i always want to have my opinion on players evolving and changing if i ever break into take lock it's a bad thing Unless that take lock is that Dave, that Dave Gettleman sucks. No, I'm just kidding. I just that's a joke to the to the listener last night who was like, "You're you guys are always so obsessive over Dave Gettleman." But um, take lock is a bad thing to have. You should evolve your opinion. Now, as far as top ten ceiling goes, traits are still important. But I believe it's he's capable. First of all, there's not many good quarterbacks in the NFL left right now. So like being top ten these days is not as hard as it used to be. <laughs> I don't even know if even it was like ever last hard. year. Right. Yeah. I don't know if it was ever hard. like top 10 to me. So at this point, I'm starting to think top five when I think of like, who are those quarter? So I think there's a haves and have nots. There's Josh Allen, Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow. And may, I think Justin Herbert, others would disagree because they haven't won games. I just think they have a horrible coaching situation. They're injured like crazy. I mean, Chargers lost their elite left tackle and elite pass rusher this year for season ending or whatever it was season ending Slater Bosa might be back. Probably not like that's ridiculous to lose in a season, but I still think there are the haves and have nots as far as elite every season you get to the playoffs with one of these guys. And they're so good at playing the quarterback position that maybe they can win you enough football games to get you to a Super Bowl and then win you that Super Bowl. And so I would say there's like, I would consider it more now top five or instead of top 10, because there's probably only what Herbert, maybe Herbert, we're, we're giving it to Herbert this podcast herbert burrow allen mahomes is that it rogers that's where it no? gets that's where it gets tricky because you have lamar who lamar. like do you want to disrespect lamar it's like ah like it's like i don't want to put him in that right now i don't think i don't so. think I he's in that category lamar. either but like no. he's right no disrespect. in that atmosphere exactly yeah. And then you have like the so Deshaun like, Watson situation. Like, what, what Watson, are you getting from Deshaun Watson? No, no, Watson point? could definitely. Uh, uh, Watson could definitely be in that conversation pretty fast. Watson's phenomenal when he's on the field. No, but I'm saying, like, is he in the stratosphere of the Mahomes? Yes. I, I would put him with the Lamars right now, just because okay. we haven't seen him play in like two years. It's been a while, man. So, okay. like, I would That's put fair. him with Lamar just just because of that. And it's a different situation. Granted, it's probably a better situation than what he had. Uh, in Houston, even though he doesn't have DeAndre Hopkins anymore, but yeah, I mean, young, young Deshaun Watson. If you can separate the, all the other stuff off the field, like 
what an exciting player. And he's still, what, 26 years old, I think? Right. So if you said it, but if you, but let's for this, our shape of this argument, sake of this argument, put, put the Watson, Rogers, Lamar in a separate tier. So now let's say that would be the top 10 tier. Can he get to that tier? So the question is, can he get to that top 10 tier? I think he can get to that tier of play. If he continues to limit the turnovers, if he continues to, you know, progress within the system, if they get him more players who can win early, like the route they had, the touchdown they had to Darius Slayton, dime ball by Daniel Jones. He hits his drop, he hits the back foot, and really layers that ball well. It has great trajectory on the football. If you watch the football from the back angle, I think the Giants showed on their sights and sounds, or from like the angle they showed, it's not the back angle, whatever that angle is, you could see that ball sizzling into Slayton, and that's a tight spiral. That ball came out real well out of his hand. That's a 35-yard dime ball right out of his hand with a great spiral, tight, compact throw hit Slayton on the money. I think that Slayton is such a weird receiver, dude. As I rewatch that play, like, I don't even know why he jumped for that ball. Why didn't he just run through that thing? That thing could have, like, hit him in stride and looked like an even bigger dime if he just runs through that. He did, like, a weird decision to early to turn his body and early jump for that thing. Like, run through that thing, track it, get under it, run through it. Um, but I guess it's just, like, Slayton is not the best in those situations at knowing what to do, whatever it is. But Jones can get to that if he continues to limit the turnovers, if he continues to if he has like because my oh my whole point with that, Nick, was that on that play we saw Slayton and Marcus Johnson win off the line of scrimmage fast and create separation. That is a great thing to see, but we haven't seen too much of that. If he starts to get more receivers like that who can do that uh, more consistently, I should say, who knows if he can start to dime up more of these deep passes as well. I think it's possible. So I think he can get to top 10, and that's definitely something I didn't think before the season. But the way he's playing football right now is by far the best of his career, in my opinion, independent of everything. I don't care that he had a couple 300-yard games in year one against like the Washington defense that quit. This is teams that care, teams that matter, football that matters. The, the Jaguars, the Ravens, the Packers are all playing for something, and he's playing great football. Uh, so, yeah, I think he can get to top 10. Now, top five, that that Burrow, Allen, tier, uh, Mahomes tier, whatever we consider it to be. No, I don't think he's going to get there. No, I don't think he can get the top five. I do think top 10 is within the range of outcomes in this system. And I think he's progressed so much from a mental standpoint, which was always our biggest gripe with Daniel Jones. I mean, he's looking safeties off. Like even on that touchdown pass, he looks directly at the safety first, holds the safety in place, hits the back foot, knows Darius Slayton's going to have leverage and fires the football. That's just a pristine play from from Daniel Jones right there and if we continue to see things like that then I think we can start considering him in that top 15 maybe we'll start you know small go from top 15 and then to top 10 because there are other quarterbacks and Daniel Jones has kind of always been a joke nationally and I always thought that was a little unfair but I never really considered him as someone who had even top 10 potential but now I think it's at least in consideration and I'll say this too about Daniel Jones man just watching like other football teams I'll see some like really good quarterbacks, quarterbacks who have had much more a longer leash than Daniel Jones say, make dumb mistakes, throw bad interceptions, miss passes, and I'm like, if that was Daniel Jones, we would be bashing the crap out of him right now. So I also feel like Daniel Jones kind of has like this short leash, and he's still not really making the mistakes. Now there are some times where he makes mistakes and he gets bailed out by a penalty. That's happened a couple times this season. It's going to happen sometimes. But in terms of what's actually happened and not been penalized on the field, he's playing pretty mistake-free football recently and i feel like that is great because he's not giving us a lot to just complain about yeah agreed it's that it's it's mistake-free football but it's also the ball placement and the off target the low off target throw percentage that's yeah. what really stands out to me too when i watch him versus other quarterbacks one of the things that i've noticed is and again this is Nick and I watching just like mostly broadcast for these other teams quarterbacks and then whoever plays the Giants we get to watch film on them it's just all we have time for but broadcast gives you something I think especially if you're watching a full football game um anyway the per the the percentage of throws on target definitely seem to be high for Daniel Jones I don't know if they're elite level top three but they're definitely in the top 10 right now and we could do this another time because there's a lot of questions to get to but it would be a fun exercise if through this point of the season we just tried to break down which quarterbacks we think are playing better than Jones uh, independent of the cast and everything like that. Cause I don't think ultimately I, everyone talks about, Oh my God, Daniel Jones has the worst receivers in the NFL. It's so bad for him. And then it seems like no one considers that he has an elite left tackle. When a lot of these quarterbacks do not have an elite left tackle, he has elite level coaching and scheming. When a lot of these teams do not have elite level coaching and scheming. So you can't only harp on the, the receiver thing when it comes to like comparing and contrasting. But it would be interesting to think about who's playing better right now because they're, I don't he know. He also has an elite running back, too. Like, an elite you're talking about yeah. 
arguably the best running back in the NFL right now. Saquon Barkley's right back in that does. conversation. Yeah, more yard, yeah, Nick, Nick Chubb be. is Nick Chubb is the one that I would be like, Ugh, that's that's there's an argument there. There's an argument, but even when in Nick Chubb's case, he still I think he still benefits from that system a little bit. It's a it's a nice run. It's a very and not to say the Giants aren't doing good things for Saquon Barkley systematically, but I don't know. So, but anyway, I would say, but yeah, it's a great question to have. Let's move on to um, Giant Roddy Piper, who asks, how do you see the offense opening up as Daniel Jones and the offense get more comfortable with it after a half season or after half a season? Do they make any significant changes with the bye week and maybe players getting healthy? Well, the player that could get healthy is Kenny Galladay, and I think yeah. they might explore bringing somebody in, but maybe not via trade. I know we have trade questions that we'll go over, so we'll tackle those then, but I wouldn't rule out bringing in a wide receiver maybe off the street that they know if Kenny Galladay's development from coming back is slowed down, especially now that Kadarius Tony is not going to be relied upon. That could be something that they bring in at the end of this week, depending on their roster situation, but... In terms of opening up, I think this 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 coaching staff just does a great job adjusting to what the defense is going to do to them. So whatever the defense is presenting, I trust this coaching staff to find the vulnerabilities within that defense. So I think it's going to be different game by game. It's not like a structured thing where it's like, well, this week we're going to do this. And I, I think yeah. it's going to be based on the coverages that the defense present because we, we've even seen it. We broke it down on the all 22. They've run post wheels so much, which is a great concept to defeat, you know, quarters and cover four, which is a coverage that has proliferated around the NFL. But Dan, they haven't thrown the post or the wheel yet. And we've seen it about twice every single game. They just use it as a clear out. They're going to hit that post and wheel eventually whenever there is some sort of coverage mishap. So I think we're going to start maybe seeing a little bit more explosive plays through the air, but it's going to take the opposing defense to make the mistakes. I feel like Dable and Kafka are telling Daniel Jones and doing a great job at doing this. Like, hey, if it's not there, don't take it. Take the check down. Take that, take that third progression. And Daniel Jones is doing a really good job. Bang, bang, getting through his progressions and finding that third option who's typically open because those first two options cleared out the the, uh, the area for the third option. So yeah. I think I hope more explosive plays happen, Dan. But if they don't, I'm not going to cry about it because mm -hmm. I think uh, what they're doing right now is working. Yeah, it's a good way to put it, Nick. I think at this point, we don't have, as far as the second half of that question goes, we don't have that much to look forward to anymore with the injury boost. Like that was Tony for me. That was 100%. Kadarius Tony gets back on the field. Who knows what could happen with this offense? It could take a huge jump. Galladay, to me, doesn't offer anywhere near the potential jump that Tony could have offered this offense, not just from a schematic standpoint, because Tony fit it so much better than a Kenny Galladay fits this style of offense, but also from just an overall how they look on the field. Like Tony moved in a different way. Tony created yards that weren't there for this offense, and it sucks to me still because I just, I just wish he was on the team and everything would have just worked out behind the scenes because... The team could be so much better with him. There's no reason to cry over spilled milk, and there still is an opportunity for this offense to start to make bigger plays, Giant Roddy. As we said earlier, if we have more examples of Marcus Johnson and Darius Slayton winning on the outside, and that could be Galladay too, right? It could be Galladay and Slayton. Winning on the outside, creating early separation, Jones being able to understand that, the, or to trust that these guys can create early separation, which will allow him to take more shots down the field. That's another key for this. He has to, because, you know, I was talking about this with Nick on the defensive podcast. One of the things I, I, I thought was so interesting about the Jaguars uh, offense against the Giants defense was they were creating vertical pass plays without much time in the pocket. These weren't set your typical five step, seven step dropbacks off of heavy play action. Where, where Lawrence was like taking huge drops and then taking a, you know, planting his foot, turning his head, turning, taking a step. It was quick vertical plays. They created vertical plays despite not really holding onto the football too long from the quarterback position. And how do you do that? Well, Lawrence trusted his receivers to get open and through a lot of passes with anticipation, through a lot of passes into space on that offense. I've noticed that a lot with the Jaguars offense. And that's something you're going to want to see from Daniel Jones and Giants offense in general. Because that's when you know your offense is taking the next step. When you start to see more of these anticipatory throws and you start to see a bigger trust with the quarterback and the receivers that they're going to create the separation um, so you can actually make those kinds of throws. So I think that can definitely come uh, as as Jones gets more comfortable and more importantly, as he, as he trusts these receivers. But they're going to obviously need more separation for that. To, it's, it's a two-part deal. Yeah, I would agree with that. The separation thing is... Uh... Slayton and Marcus Johnson are the two receivers, right? Who I think can create the most separation. It just sucks because neither of them um, are catch. overly consistent at catching the football, yeah. I think is a, is a nice way to put it. Yeah. So we have a question from Tozino. 
How is how I'm going to pronounce it? Baltimore under wing constantly produced quality in-house pass rushers, allowing them to let talent walk every year in free agency for comp picks. Kings. When you see what he's done with Zimenez, should we have renewed excitement about Ellerson Smith's athletic potential returning from the IR? Yeah, I tweeted this yesterday. I, I'm irrationally excited for Ellerson Smith, and I don't care who has, and I don't care because look, this defense is so it's set up for players with athleticism to have an opportunity to make an impact at some point and not be forced. And it doesn't, we don't need Ellison Smith to come back and be an every down player. We just need him to come down and come back and give them 15 to 20 good snaps a game. And I think it's possible he can do that. So I think there is a good reason to be excited about Ellison Smith if he's healthy again. And it's not just right now for Ellison Smith, it's the health. It's the fact that he hasn't done anything at the NFL level. And he played at a smaller school. Then he missed the COVID, like he missed time due to COVID and all those constrictions. So restrictions, I should say. So it's still open-ended as far as if Smith is even an NFL player right now and can produce at an NFL field, but talent and Wayne Martindale, it got, there's no reason to not be excited when you have those two things. I'm excited to see what they do with Ellerson Smith because he doesn't have a lot of experience dropping into coverage, but last week, and we talked about this on the defensive podcast and, and I thought about it a little bit. They had Kayvon Thibodeau playing Sam a lot. And we were like, why don't, why don't, they try to put him on the other side so we can avoid the tight ends. I think a big reason why he was playing Sam, which is a which is a pivotal position in Wink Martindale's defense, was because O'Shane Zimenez wasn't dressing. Because right. a lot of these previous games, Dan, it was O'Shane Zimenez who was playing Sam, and he was the one faking the rush, dropping underneath the number two and the number three. And he's had several big plays throughout the season doing that. But without O'Shane Zimenez, you're not going to ask Jahad Ward to do that consistently. Typically, when Jahad Ward drops off in the coverage, it's going to the middle of the field. He's not really going to the sideline, whereas O'Shane Zimenez and Kayvon Thibodeau, they drop to the sideline a little bit more. But my fascination is Ellison Smith, who doesn't have experience doing it, but his athletic profile and length suggests that he can do what O'Shane Zimenez does. And I think he might be really dangerous in that role if Wink Martindale has kind of developed and groomed him to do that. So that means you now have a second option opposite of O'Shane Zimenez in passing situations to drop into coverage or send as a rusher. And they can do both while Kayvon Thibodeau can feast on the other side. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. And so, yep. Uh, thanks for the question, Tazina. We'll move on to Jim Henry, who asks, now that the Giants are somehow six and one, do you do you think Saquon or do you air Saquon and anyone else remotely banged up next week? Do you rest? I think it, it would say Saquon Barkley or anyone else remotely banged up next week to get them almost three weeks off to fully heal. Sounds crazy, but the season is more important than one game this week. So I'm guessing he's talking about resting them for the Seattle game. Yeah. No, yeah, I then they would have the bye week and then it would be a three. Yeah. Be essentially, you get three weeks off for the player. No, nah, Jim Henry, the, every game is so valuable. And I know Saquon's a little bit dinged up. I think you'll see more Matt Breida like we saw last week. You know, you'll see more of a split. In, in carries, but you're still going to use Saquon Barkley because he's such a game breaker. And I think if the coaching staff went to Saquon Barkley, was like, hey, you know what? Just rest up this week because we have a bye week. We want you to be fully healthy for the stretch run. Saquon Barkley would probably give the coaching staff the finger. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't think Saquon Barkley would want to say. I also don't think the Giants have much of a chance to win games. Saquon Barkley isn't on the field right now because that's part of the – look, everyone talks about like <laughs> – Part, part of the reason the Giants are moving the football so well and scoring in the red zone is because, and not just in the red zone, the red zone is the design, but score, moving the ball into the red zone, I should say, is because every single team is starting to game plan just to take away Saquon Barkley. They're just stacking the box. They're doing all these different things to try to take away Barkley. You take Barkley off the field, then what is the defense going to do? It's going to play a lot more drop back man or drop back zone and just kind of like the, like you saw when Barkley was out and they had Gallman in there, they didn't really stack the box against Gallman. There was no need to. And that's when the offense has struggled in the past when they're part of the reason offense is working right now, overall Jones included is because it's set up to really make things easier for a quarterback in my mind, because the defense is fully sold out to stop Saquon Barkley at all times. Now you take that one guy off the field, the defense is fully sold out to stop they're going to stop buying, you know, you're going to, the eye candy pre-snap isn't going to work as well. There's not going to be as much, as many openings in the passing game or the running for the quarterback scramble pass game. Let's just say the scramble game for the quarterback, because 
defenses starts dropping their players because there's no one to really focus on. So you can't take Barkley off the field right now. He he means too much for the offense for this version of the offense for what the for how the offense is operating right now. And given what they have at receiver now with Tony, not not a chance to work back in the mix. I don't know if there's really any other path for them to have a good offense this year. So no to Barkley. The question would be: Is there anyone else that comes to mind, Nick, that like could use three weeks right now to get fully right? Um, I don't know. I would say that would be like if they were trying to trot Ojalari there. Leonard Williams would be an interesting one. I don't know Williams' injury situation, Nick, but he could be someone you would consider, right? As like if he's still not fully healthy, but he looked pretty good on tape, I thought, against the Jaguars in a game where not really anyone but him, uh, Dexter, Adori, and I guess Thibodeau to some extent looked good on tape. So I would say if Williams needed the time, maybe someone like him. Yeah, I don't really think they're going to rest. No. anybody unless they have an actual injury and like you said like anojolari if he was a couple more weeks progressed and wasn't on ir someone like that but Leonard williams right. played the last two games i don't think they're gonna be like all right you just rest this one i think you need all hands on deck to defeat seattle which is not something we thought at the beginning of the season but at the same time we didn't think the giants were going to be in this position either yeah and this is a big game like this is one of those games that playoff teams look at that they it was like a mini playoff preview type of game it's a four and three team against a six and one team so it still means a lot sees the moment asks can you or nick talk about evan neal's replacement thus far the line has given jones time i'm concerned with a new right tackle it could give us the ish it could give us some issues in pass production and running which which they like to do behind neal i love the pod as always thank you yeah so tyree phillips he had some plays I felt like in the run game where he was getting hip to hip with Glowinski. He was driving people off the ball, similar to what we've seen from Evan Neal. I think it's a slight downgrade from Evan Neal, but if we're going to be realistic here, Evan Neal wasn't playing at a high level. So I only think it's a slight downgrade. And it's not like Tyree Phillips was at a position too much. There were a couple of times where there were defenders wide of him. I think it was Trayvon Walker and his, he took too flat of an angle and kind of gave up his outside shoulder. And then he had to flip his hips and basically scramble. And he's a pretty good athlete, Tyree Phillips for his size to at least kind of flip his hips and then use his length to get hands on that edge rusher to try to not allow him to get into the pocket whenever he does make a mistake. But I didn't see too many mistakes from him. So I'm not overly concerned about it. Ideally, you'd want Evan Neal in there for a lot of reasons for his development and because there's more upside there with Evan Neal. But we've had in recent memory, Dan, a lot worse offensive linemen step in and be forced to start than I believe Tyree Phillips actually is. So I'm not too concerned as of right now. And I hope that doesn't bite me in the ass. Yeah, look, call it luck or call it great planning and great a great eye for talent. But in the past, the Giants have had like Nate Solder trotting out week after week at right tackle, with the only other option being Matt Parrott, who looked as bad, if not worse, than Solder. Now, Joe Shane in his first year finds them somebody like Tyree Phillips, who is light years already ahead of what they got out of Solder and Parrott. And it's just crazy to see the difference, the stark contrast, and the ability to find someone who can step in as a swing tackle, like Phillips is going to have to do, and actually perform at a pretty high level. And as Nick said, not only at a high level, maybe at a level that's pretty close to what they got from Neil. Was Neil improving at, in, in the most recent week? Sure. But he still wasn't playing dominant football. And there were some pretty damn good plays on Phillips's film. The, the 19-yard throw to Sills over the middle, Phillips was on an island there. And he took the defender out of the play, took the pass rusher out of the play despite being on an island with really good hand usage. He's a big dude out there. He can use his hands. He even had some plays in the red zone where he blocks down and clears out a, a big area for Saquon Barkley to cut into. And so he might even offer something more in the run game potentially or as good as what Neil offered. So I'm pretty hopeful on this one, too, that he could actually be not much of a drop off. That's I, that's the ideal, I think. Uh thing that we're hoping for right now. There's just not much of a drop off. Like we said, he's not Evan Neal. Evan Neal has more upside, but for sure. I don't think this is that big of a difference where Evan Neal is currently at his career because every week we kind of came on here and we were like, yeah, Evan Neal, Evan Neal made a mistake here, made a mistake here, made a mistake here. I think it was starting to get a little better, but then he got hurt. So hopefully once he comes back from this MCL injury, that trajectory continues to ascend. And kudos to Joe Shane, who's taking some heat right now because of this Tony trade, which is not even his fault. Like this is not, this would never be on his roster. Kadarius Tony would have never been on his roster to begin with. He's never going to draft this guy. So take the heat, even though I don't think he deserves the heat because Tony's just off field issues um, and give him some credit because he found Tyree Phillips. That was a big, big, big find for this team. Definitely was. 
Austin Ionetta asked, do you guys think Landon Collins in a linebacker role would be more effective in stopping outside zone runs, especially with Kenneth Walker coming up? Also, who is the most overrated and underrated band and artist in your opinion? So let's tackle the Landon uh-huh. Collins question first, uh-huh. and then we'll go into that. Yeah. My thoughts on this, and I'm, I'll, I'll be curious to get your take, Nick, because this is a little bit more outside the box. Not outside the box, but I guess more inside football. My thoughts on this is that I would lean no to this answer. and Basically being Landon Collins has been a safety his entire career, his entire life. I remember hearing a story when he was early in his draft, uh, early in his career with the Giants, like after his breakout. And he was like, you know, I've been playing safety this position since I was youth football. It's been such a dream. I wanted to be a safety forever. I played at Alabama, the highest of highs. So now you're asking somebody who's been a safety his whole career and has instincts of a safety to play linebacker, to read key, to do all the things that a linebacker needs to do to help stop the run plays and to help be in, be in the right run fits at the right time and to scrape over the top. So are, is there flashes that I think he could provide to the situation? Sure. Like there will be some splash plays where he either has great penetration and makes a stop in the backfield or shows off more speed when he just decides to go with it and try to go sideline to sideline to make a play. But overall, I think there could be more examples potentially of him going into the wrong run fit where another Giants defender is already going into or him out of position that leads to a big play. So I would guess that it would be worse for the Giants defense. I think so, too. And I think you're, we're going to see it, like we said on the last podcast, a lot of 12, a lot of 13 personnel, which is going to force the Giants to play those linebackers. And those linebackers will go out there. And I'm curious to see if they do come out in 12 personnel and if they still want to use Landon Collins in the box. I'm not ruling against that because Wink Martindale does what he wants. And maybe they have enough mm-hmm. trust in Landon Collins to execute those assignments. But then you're going to have linemen. I mean, this is outside zone. You're going to have linemen climbing up right onto your chest and Landon Collins is going to have to do a job to stack and shed, which our linebackers don't do an excellent job of. And Landon Collins, like Dan said, is a safety. So there's going to be a transitional period there that could lead to big plays against the New York Giants defense. So I'm not overly confident that he will just quickly assimilate and become like an every down linebacker or anything like that. But I think you'll see him in the middle of the defense at times whenever the Seattle Seahawks are in 11 personnel and, and personnel packages that are lighter. Yep. All right. Now let's try tackle the other one, Nick. You're not the biggest music guy, but I think you know you have enough music takes to dive into this one. If not, I get it. Overrated, okay. underrated band ever. So I want you to go first because I got to rack my brain. See, like with, with music, yeah. like I love music and I could sit there and like, I haven't even mentioned like my affinity for like the Buddy Hollies and the Chuck Berries of the world and stuff like that. Like I like a lot of older music, but it takes me time to like think back to like, oh yeah, I went through an entire phase in my 20s of listening to that because it's not something that yeah. is always on my mind. So Dan, you're much more equipped to answer this. And then I'll throw in an answer that I'm just going to come with up with on the spot a little bit later. Well, I saw that video you posted on Twitter the other day um, with, uh, so what was great. it? Yoko Ona, is that who it was? Yep. Yep. Just like screaming in the middle of a song and, and Chuck Bro. Berry being like, what the hell is my life right Bro. now? There was a while in my life where I would just be like, you know, sitting there, you know, at night hanging out and I'd just go to YouTube and I'd watch that video and Chuck <laughs> Berry's eyes and how he's like, and you know, John yeah, Lennon's yeah. just like doing his thing. He's like, Yeah, that's my girl, whatever. And like Chuck Berry's like, I want nothing to do with this. I want out of this situation right now. Yeah. I love Chuck Berry, man. He's um he's truly great. That video was very reminiscent of Donna Jean uh, in in when she when the when Grateful Dead are playing in the playing in the band. I don't, you probably don't get this right. You're not a Grateful Dead guy, but there's I, just I like, like Dead. I like some okay. of their songs. Tucker Gray is an amazing song, but like I'm not a Grateful Dead head or anything like that. So for a while there, they tried to bring in like this uh, studio artist Donna Jean to like play live with them, and she like had issues like with the sound and like hearing the hearing the music. So like her voice, she couldn't like t- tag up her voice so like she would get to this point in the song called playing the band where she would just like let out this like belt scream and it was just like so awful sounding and it's just like oh, there's memes of it all over the internet it's like super popular just like jerry's voice and like the beauty of grateful dead and then it's like and here comes donna jean just getting to rip rip through the song so i would say to answer the question i'm gonna go with most overrated ever this is one of my Known to known by all the, my friends and anyone who have ever said this take to Nick as my worst take of all time. Oh, this can be great. super disrespectful. But in my opinion, the most overrated band of all time, they have to factor in how high they're rated. Okay. So keep that in mind. I think my I know opinion, what you're going to say. Overrated band. Well, let me see who you think I was going to say. If Are you going to say the Beatles? Opinion. Yeah, it's the Beatles. I can't yeah. believe you guessed that. Have I told you this take before? Potentially? You must have. You must okay. have. And then like. Whatever you said, it's where they're rated. And honestly, dude, it's funny, man, because early Beatles stuff and this kind of like 
me saying this makes me seem like I'm more of a music aficionado than I am, but something that kind of transformed the Beatles before they ended up going to India was Bob Dylan, who went up to the Beatles, the Beatles like revered, and Bob Dylan told them like, hey, you guys aren't saying anything with your music. You guys are just out there playing these songs. And like Paul McCartney and John Letter are like, oh. <laughs> and like they got all much more like messaging behind a lot of their music after like Bob Dylan kind of like, I guess you could say diss them, even though it wasn't meant to be a, a disrespectful. <laughs> but I always felt like that was pretty cool because I went through a Beatles fan uh, phase as well. I, I like the Beatles I'm definitely more than you, but uh, I wouldn't call myself, you know, an, a, f- a fan of them per se. I like them. My take is not that I don't enjoy their music. I can put on their music. Here Comes the Sun is one of my favorite songs, maybe of all time. And that's one of their songs. Um, It's beautiful music. The reason I think they're overrated is because they're viewed as the best band of all time, or if not the best, one of the best, like one of that elite tier. And I just don't know how you can be the best band of all time when you don't have a good drummer, you don't have a good guitarist, and you don't really have good, but you don't really have anything but melody and songwriting and, and singing. Like, I just, I need more out of my band, man. I need bass lines i need guitar riffs i need sick drums and like it's part of the reason why like if i wanted to pivot to another band that i'd say overrated or another musical artist that is overrated give me like stevie Oki and all these like freaking popular uh like um what are, what's the genre called it's not techno anymore it's called like house all the popular house music people because if i go to a live show and all you're doing is press, pressing buttons on a computer that sucks that's not live music that's terrible i have no respect for that type of music like live i just think it's embarrassing like it's not music it's just you're pressing buttons on a computer it's it's tough you're stringing together sounds and like you're making something that sounds good from the computer but i want live i want you to produce the music with your hands and with your <laughs> with things like that so <laughs> I'll put all those how popular house people in the most overrated of all time too, because they're super rated high. Underrated, I'm gonna make my case here in my pitch for my morning jacket, one of my favorite bands of all time. A very not popular band. Nobody knows about them. They got mostly popular in the early 2000s, but they're still playing. They're still putting out great albums. They're playing live. Their live sets are three hours a piece. They're phenomenal stuff. So you get a little bit of everything with my morning jacket. You get a little bit of blues, you get a little bit of jam. You get a lot of good guitar. You get a lot of good drums. You get Jim James, who has some people think is like a revolutionary voice. I would agree with that. And you get a message behind a lot of the music too. They go slow. They go. They go fast. Their songs have different components to them. They have "Touch Me" uh, if you want. "Touch Me" Part Two, which is um, if you touch me, I just think I'll scream. Part Two. That's one of the names of one of their songs, which is like a a total like wild psychedelic <laughs> rock song. This is this is just touch me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird name for a song but it's good music psychedelic song so check it out it's my pitch check out my morning jacket i think you guys will like them start with it still moves the album move on to z those are my two favorites and uh you go from there for overrated i, I honestly am not qualified to probably give an overrated but i'm gonna just throw out a name that i feel like one direction like what do they do like i, I have no idea are they like a popular band like i think there's a guy that like everybody always talks about harry styles i think his name is like i i don't know anything about the band i've heard some of their songs they're okay you know and then i hear like a lot of people saying that they're the best band and modern music and all that stuff and i don't really jive with it so i'll just throw that out there and then as for underrated and i'm not a big screamo type guy and this isn't a screamo <laughs> band but it's more of a rock band it, it was a band called taproot you ever hear taproot yeah so I went to a concert when I was like 23 years old and it was a concert inside of a club of maybe, you know, 40 people or something like that. Not a lot of people. And it's, this is, they're on tour. So they're going from, you know, Pittsburgh to Philadelphia, all the way up to New York City to tour. And they stopped in this little bar called the Stanhope House in Stanhope, New Jersey, up in Sussex County, New Jersey. Really small. No one really knows it. And I thought they would go in there and basically mail it in because they were on tour. And I got to tell you, man, they performed insanely for the 40 people in that club yeah. right there. It was I, I had so much respect. They were screaming their lungs out. They were going crazy. They were jumping around. And I was like, I expected like, you know, a, oh, they're there. It's cool, <laughs> whatever. But no, bro, they really balled out. And it's a band that I probably haven't listened to in years. And I'm definitely not going to say they're the most uh, underrated. But that performance was uh, was excellent. And they did it for 40 freaking people. So I'm going to give them the cred there. I love a good live music performance. I love live music. I go to a ton of concerts and you could feel the energy with the band. There have been concerts where the energy has been amazing in some of my favorite bands. And concerts, quite frankly, with energy has been terrible. Some of my favorite bands. The recent Arctic Monkeys tour that I that they were on after uh, the Tranquility-based hotel, 
album drop. They had no energy as a band when I saw them live in Boston. And that when they released AM, their album before that, they had insane energy when I saw them in MSG. So just like energy makes such a big difference, I think, for live music. Did you, have you ever heard of a country music artist who also kind of does a little bit of rap named Corey Smith? He's out of Georgia. No, I think you once showed me one thing by him, but I can't remember. Yeah, he, he's talented and, and I like his stuff and good melodies and stuff like that and stuff like that. But uh, my friend and I got tickets to his show in Nashville and we sat in the front row and I never sit in the front row. That's not us. Right. He got the tickets and he was like, hey, I want to treat you to this. I was like, all right. So we sat in the front row and it was a fun experience. But like to your point, he wasn't really into it that much, bro. He like went up there with his guitar and just wore sunglasses the whole time. It was like, oh, you guys are too kind. And I, like, I just thought I was like, damn, I got front row tickets to a freaking concert. And this guy <laughs> isn't really like hyping us up or anything like that. So it's a little bit disappointing. <laughs> but other than that, I yeah. like his music. Yeah, it matters uh, for these things. Okay. Chris Clark asks, thoughts on Josh Azuto so far? And what does he need to improve on to become a full-time starter? He needs to improve on his consistency, I would say. I think he needs a little bit more of an anchor. I think he allows defenders to get underneath his pads and like just churn their feet through him, and he can't really hunker down. He doesn't have maybe enough sand in his ass as of right now. I think those are things that he definitely needs to work on. As of run blocking, he has some highlight plays. There are some times where he's not in position. I still think his hands are really good once he can get a hold of you. And I think there's a ton of upside with Josh Azudo. I just think strength at the point of attack specifically in pass protection when he's moving backwards is something that he needs help with. Yeah. Nick nailed it. As far as I see it, it's can be broken down on the top level pass protection on the second level. It's his anchor within pass protection. There's still too many plays of him getting displaced off his feet. Uh, like I pushed off his feet, forklifted at times. So yeah, it would just be the pass protection and the strength in his anchor. And that's something that the good news is he has the strength right? Like we have seen him on the move in the run game. So we know this dude has pure power to his game and has that element. So it's not an issue of strength for me or natural strength. It's just an issue of technique and coaching. And so far, so good as far as what these coaches have done with other players. That and comfortability too. Cause there are yeah. times where if you're watching on film, he's kind of looking around, it's like oh, over here, over here, over here. Yeah, and the then time. he has a couple blown assignments and things like that. So once he gets a little bit more comfortable, I think those blown assignments will stop happening so often. True. Step back, Jerry asks, would you give up a second or a third this year and a fourth or a fifth next year for Judy if they took on the Galladay contract? Yeah, dude. Like, look, if you want to if you want to tell me that I can give up a second or a third this year, I'll say I'll even give up the second this year and the fourth next year. So I guess that's 2024 fourth. Um, I do second and a four for Judy, plus they take on Galladay because getting that Galladay contract off the book alone would be a huge win for the Giants. That's a lot of cap space next year. Everyone's talking about, oh, they're going to cut Galladay. They might, dude, but that's a shit ton of dead cap if they cut Galladay next year. It's not good. It's not pretty. If you look at that contract, Dave Gettleman pushed so much of it back. I mean, he only took like two or three million against the cap in the first year last year as part of his whole like go all in plan with like the Kyle Rudolphs of the world and the Logan Ryan's of the world. But so that Galladay contract is pushed further back and there, there's another pot shot at Gettleman for those who are counting at home. But that, that, um, that Galladay contract is pushed so much far back or cap wise. There's still so much to go there. So just getting that off would be huge. Then you also get Judy. So you lose a two and a four and you get the, and you gain Judy plus the Galladay contract off your book. So I would take that. I would as well, and I can say pretty confidently that that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, I can say confidently the Broncos would not take that. Yeah, exactly. Pitch 5 for AC asks, rumors of a move of Judy. If this wasn't already covered on the pod, what do you see as his role, and would a move for him be a good idea considering the wide receiver position and how the wide receiver position looks in next year's draft? Dan and I have yet to really go over that part yet, but what do you think of his role within this offense? I don't love the idea of trading for Judy, to be completely honest, because we know that this offense is an option route offense. We know that this offense is difficult to pick up for some players, and that's not to say I think Judy would be one of them, but it's difficult in general for anyone to pick up. And it's based on timing and chemistry as well, and the quarterback being on the same page as the receiver with these option routes. If you trade for anyone right now, it doesn't matter who it is, he's going to take time to have to pick up this playbook. And then he's going to take time to have to get on the same page with the quarterback. And he's going to have to take time to understand where to be on these option routes. It could be, you know, more of a 2024 or sorry, 2023 decision than a 2022 if they trade for anyone right now. So I would just prefer not to trade a premium pick. And that's what the Broncos want for a player who might take time. Yeah, I'm right there with you. 
I think it's good that Brian Dable has experience with Jerry Judy from their time back at Alabama. I mean, the offense that he ran at Alabama is probably a lot different than the offense he runs now. So that doesn't mean that Jerry Judy knows exactly what is going on, but there could be similar terminology. But regardless, I'm right there with Dan. I don't think trading like a second and a fourth or whatever it would take to get just Jerry Judy is probably the best process. And this regime right now seems very process oriented. I don't know if they're going to deviate off of said process. Luke Morris asks, any chance Shane swaps the return for Tony into another young piece under contract that doesn't really necessarily have to be a wide receiver? Yeah, similar question. I would say there's a chance. There's always a chance for anything in the NFL. And there's always a chance for any trade with Joe Shane too, or any of these GMs. But I would guess no. I think he wants these picks. I'm right there with Dan. Dan, you want to take the next question? This is a good one. Yeah, TJ Gagliardi asks, what's your favorite football moment? Easily Super Bowl 42 for me. I think my favorite football moment of all time was David Tyree catching that football because I couldn't watch it with my mom or my two brothers because I was such an avid fan. I had to go downstairs and watch it with just my dad. So it was just me and my dad downstairs. And when David Tyree caught that ball, we freaked out because we heard my older brother upstairs and that TV was slightly ahead of the TV that my father and I were watching. And we heard, Oh my God, wait, wait, what, what? And that's exactly what we heard. So me and my dad are like, Oh, what the f- happened? Like, Oh, uh, I have no idea. And then we saw it and we were just so mind blown that my dad and I ran upstairs and we all watched it as a family, which we should have done in the beginning. But <laughs> it was, it was one of my favorite experiences, not just in football, but in my life to, to be honest, Super Bowl 42. That's cool because I think about that, like, the Nick Filato family watching together at the same moment in time as the Schneier family, as we were watching together. And it is the greatest moment for me as well. I had myself, my brother, my mom, my dad, my cousin, Ari. We had, a, I think we had a few of, of the fa- extended family in as well. Some cousins, some uncles. And after the giants won that game, I just will always remember this like weird, like in the moment circle we had together with our arms around each other in a circle just jumping around like it's just like something you don't plan for just a pure moment of elation then you just like go into some weird thing that you just weren't expecting to do and just like at the time we're in our collective brains are like let's just get together huddle around each other put our arms around the back and jump around in a in a, in a, in a group and so it's definitely the 2007 super bowl for me as well the 42 but i'll say some other moments that come come close have been the first playoff game in MetLife during the 2011 run against the Falcons where the Giants absolutely annihilated them 24 to 2 just when Hakeem Nicks caught that that uh, quick inbreaker over the middle and then split the two defenders uh, with the post catch just insane the best post catch run I've ever seen by any Giant including Odell Beckham because there was just it was so hard to imagine anyone could split that and turn that into a touchdown that stadium was rocking i would say the other one for me would be when i was much younger the giants played in the 2000s championship game against the vikings at home they scored a touchdown early they recovered a fumble uh, on a kickoff and then scored another touchdown to go like 14 nothing and then the giants just cruised completely in that game and it was just a pure celebration in the stands and that just that just that feeling of celebrating with all giants fans around you for so long like two and a half hours of pure celebration the game was never at risk that was a great feeling as well God, I love football, especially when the New York Giants are good. Andrew Burke asks, I got a great one. Riddle me this. Why do Coughlin and Brown make nonstop plays but can't sniff the field? The plays are on special team. And they can't sniff the field on defense over Crowder and Smith. Also, I'd like to see more five defensive linemen and six defensive back. Ward as one of the three, four defensive ends. Well, those are good questions. The first one would probably be what you said in the question, Andrew. Those plays have been on special teams those plays haven't been you know as linebackers so if you give them the opportunity could they make those plays maybe but right now wink martindale obviously doesn't trust them to make those plays uh would be my take there um anything what are your thoughts there before we get into the second part i think wink martindale knows his personnel enough to to put them into positions of success and as bad as jalen smith was last week if we don't see any other linebacker stepping in there, and I don't even think it would be Coughlin or Brown, it would be Micah McFadden first. If they don't step in there, I think it says something about their readiness to jump into this system. So that's kind of where I'm at there. I'm kind of just trusting this coaching staff, and I know that this coaching staff is doing its best job determining who is the best fit out there on Sunday. Yep, and as far as the second part of that question goes, 
Yeah, I get it. You want that personnel package because it means no linebackers on the field, no Tay Crowder and no Jalen Smith. Uh, but, you know, it just doesn't work. You need to have probably a mic on for most of these plays, a traditional mic. You need to have some you need you need to have some kind of second level, I guess, safety to in, in case the, the team wants to just like do different things to you from a schematic standpoint that can give them opportunities in the run game. So it's an interesting a personnel grouping and I'm sure we'll see it at some point and I'd be interested to see it in the right spots, but it's not something I think you can do regularly. Yeah. So for the five defensive linemen, I'm guessing you're incorporating the outside linebackers into the right. defensive line, which I would say we've seen that personnel package quite a bit. We saw it a lot against Baltimore. It really just depends on the opponent. And that's what I love most about Wink Martindale is he's very loose with, with his personnel packaging and, and how he, how the, whatever the offense is trying to do, he's going to call the best personnel package to defend that offense. Ideally, you don't want the linebackers on the field, but if you're going up against, you know, Patrick Ricard and two tight ends, you're not going to roll Landon Collins out there as the middle linebacker. Satoshi Guacamoto, what's going on, Satoshi? How you doing? He asks, given Azudu's great movement skills, could he play some tight end while Bellinger is out? So Satoshi never, is yeah. Satoshi is uh is one of my favorite people to comment on our stuff somewhat of a troll but a light-hearted troll is how i determine it i'm sure he will be all throughout my mentions now being like i'm not a troll what are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> is he not though i don't know if he wouldn't own up to it so i never know with satoshi i would consider it satoshi i love you buddy but i would definitely think you're trolling right like i don't know yeah. I, there's no other way to interpret your content other than this. His and name I is Satoshi Guacamoto. Right. <laughs> and it's a yeah. picture of guacamole. <laughs> yes. So or an avocado. And so look, you see, I mean, last week he caught a lot of heat when he uh, tweeted out, like, I think I saw Daniel Bellinger lose his eye on the field and people were firing. He tweeted that in one of my replies on something I posted and people were firing off on him. Just like, what are you talking about, dude? And it was clear he was trolling them. I think. Um, but I just don't know if anything's serious or real with this Guacamoto character. So I'm going to say uh, maybe you could see. Uh, well, I mean, the idea is, look, the Giants have had some other big personnel packages where they do use a lineman as a, as a tight end or like an extra blocker at the end of the line of scrimmage. I don't think it'll be a Zudu, especially given the fact that now Bredesen is out. But uh, if you're answering it seriously, it would say that, you know, the Giants do like to use those packages. They wanted to last week. And when they had the injuries on the O-line that forced Tyree Phillips in, it kind of didn't give him that opportunity. Yeah, Debra Hamilton is now the, the big offensive lineman, sure. was Tyree Phillips. And now he just steps up. He had some good tape back in the preseason. Frank the Tank, what's going on, Frank? He asks, have you guys ever been to upstate New York? If so, what parts? If not, anything you want to check out? Food, parks, lakes? So, yeah, I love going to upstate New York, mostly for the parks and for the hiking. I've been up there a few times to hike. I one time went up there, hiked, and then went to the casino, the new casino around there. Shit casino, though. Not a good poker room, um, which is what I based the casino on. And I forget. And it was weird, too. I hate the casinos where it's like you have one. It's all it's all like funneled into one area where you can get in and everything else is blocked off because they're so worried, I guess, about like younger people coming in, which is weird enough. Um, so if you know that casino, it's in the Catskills area or somewhere in the upstate New York area and not a good casino, letting that be known. But I do go, want like to go up there for the parks. Um, Lake George is nice in the summer. So, yeah. I always wanted to make it up to the Adirondacks and, and just have like, you know, a cabin up there for, for a couple of days. It's something I've always wanted to do. I have a buddy who um is from south colony and schenectady like that area and he got married up in albany so i went up there for the wedding and i visited him a couple of times and i liked it it's just it reminds me a little bit of you know rural new jersey only a little bit colder <laughs> all right dixie n asks if you were joe shane would you use your capital now to trade for an affordable wide receiver or sit on the picks and draft your own probably sit on the picks and draft their own we've kind of answered this question several times throughout yeah. the podcast anything different there dan no, we've answered this already. I would say a similar question would be here. Tom Newman. Newman. I just wanted to, I, I literally just wanted to ask this next Newman. one. Because of the Newman, yeah, I just wanted to get <laughs> Newman. Um, so he asked a similar question about, you know, trading. So we can, we can move past that. Green Machine asked, what would be your guys' dream destination? Green Machine Green has been asking some interesting questions lately. I, I love Green Machine. <laughs> I'd probably say Italy because I was supposed to go to Italy uh, back in before or during the pandemic, I guess, but then the pandemic happened. So I never really got to, so I would love to go to Naples, Calabria, and then check out Sicily and, and see the homeland. Cause I have yet to be there yet. 
for me, it would probably be another trip down to Southeast Asia. So I went to Thailand once when I was younger in college um, and then haven't been back to any of Southeast Asia. So I would want to check out like Vietnam and other and other things of that nature. Uh, actually, is Vietnam even out there? This could be really bad if this, this is going to end up being a horrible moment if that's not considered Southeast Asia. But there's no. areas. Yeah, it is. OK, good, good, good. Yeah. Uh, Laos, all those places I would love to check out. So we have an interesting question from Nicholas Bassian. Would you make a move this season or off season for T Higgins? I can't see the Bengals signing Chase Burrow and Higgins. Recent trade could be comparable to what the Eagles did for AJ Brown. Yeah, Nicholas, that's a really interesting take. And I would be all for the aggression of trying to get a younger number one wide receiver. Now that we did this already with Kenny Galladay. So you think you might be thinking, why would we make this thing again? But I guess it would depend on the type of receiver for me. T. Higgins actually wouldn't be that type of guy, Nick, because for some quarterbacks like Joe Burrow, I think T. Higgins is an incredible fit for quarterbacks like Daniel Jones and where this offense is moving. I don't th I think I'm off these types of receivers, like the bigger bodied guys who don't win as much with natural separation. Though Higgins separates for his size really well. I want to make that clear. But that's not all his what his game is about. And for Jones right now, I think for what he is as a quarterback, even just dating back to some of the few snaps we've seen from Jones with a player like John Ross, right? A guy who had a lot of separation skills and ability and at least the speed to separate. I almost think Jones is better off with those types of receivers. So I'm looking more for those types of players. Plus, I don't think the Bengals are trading T. Higgins anytime soon. Yeah, I don't know if they're going to trade T. Higgins either. They're in a Super Bowl type of window right now with a really good quarterback. I'd be open to it, I think, but that doesn't mean I'm I'm definitely jumping all over just because I believe in T. Higgins' talent. And I don't know much about his processing, but from everything I've seen, he seems like he's where he needs to be. I don't know if if there's as many choice type of routes, if you want to put that kind of label on it in Zach Taylor's offense, but I know he's very talented, so that would just allow me to be open to it. Dane Metcalf asks, how do you boys feel about Feliciano with the impending return of Gates? He's not a top tier center, but he seems extremely comfortable with this offense. Do we slide Gates to left guard if he is healthy and ready to go? I mean, he was activated to the roster, so that's presumable. So what are your thoughts on Nick Gates and the offensive line? Yeah, I mean, let's just for the sake of this question, Nick, assume that Gates is able to play at the same level he was before the injury. That's a big jump to make, and that may not be the case. But let's just say for the sake of this argument, Gates is the old Gates. If Gates is the old Gates, I want Gates at center, not left guard, not at right tackle, not in any of these other positions. I still think that Gates, I know they tried to do it out of desperation last year to move him to guard because they just had no, they just were so screwed on the interior line. But to me, from what I've seen from his skill set and from what are the things from the tape, like the things that he's done well on tape, always helping, you know, always good, good processing from the center position and pass production. Those are things finishing plays. Those are things that I think are better suited for him at center, especially post injury. So I wouldn't even mind if it's old gates. I put him in right away over Feliciano. There are some things I think Feliciano could offer in the run game a little better than gates, but overall not a big drop off there in my mind would be Gates, the run game versus Feliciano. And I think there would be a big jump with Gates and pass protection over Feliciano. Now that may not be the case again. He has to be fully healthy, but that's where I would take it. I would, I would train Gates for center. Yeah, I think I'm right there with you. And with Azudu, if Azudu can continue to play the way he's playing, then I think he should just start at left guard. And I think right. John Feliciano can start at guard. He did for the Buffalo Bills. So that's within his wheelhouse in this offense. But I think I'm right there with you. But a lot of stuff still has to happen for Nick Gates. Now we've got a question from Jake Oyala. I'm going to go there. It seems that Shane and Dable value their mantra of smart, tough, and dependable when making moves for the team. With that said, which wide receiver trade target do you think will fit that bill the best? We kind of already asked that. Mm -hmm. I think Brian Dable has the inside track of knowing Jerry Judy just from Jerry Judy's time at Alabama during his freshman year. So there's there's some connection there, but I don't necessarily see a trade coming about for a top tier guy like that. Dan, are you on the same page? Yeah, I don't even necessarily think they're going to trade for any receiver, to be honest, yeah. at this point. So, yeah. Elliot Goldman asks, if Shane and Dable were in charge of the pick the Giants used on Tony, who do you think they would have went with? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a great question, actually, especially if you, like, you know, throw it back to that time where the Giants roster was at versus where the roster is at now. You can't look at it where the roster is at now because they wouldn't have had Thibodeau and they wouldn't have had Wondell Robinson. They wouldn't have had Evan Neal. So there's more needs based on that. As far as where I think they would go with it, smart, tough, dependable, that's a great question. I think Eli Moore is, and I know he's getting bad rap now because 
some things that have happened. So maybe that's probably not the best person thing, but I, I would say that's partially just because he's playing with Zach Wilson in that offense. And it's just life is hell right there for the jets passing game right now. Um, but he's probably not someone you could probably, I guess, throw into just in case there. It's a good question. I don't know. Smart, tough, dependable from that class in that range. So why it's so fascinating to me is because you had so many COVID opt-outs that were drafted at yeah. the end of that draft. So how does that factor in? Because one guy who comes in my mind was a COVID opt-out who had one really good season in Miami, and that's Gregory Rousseau, who was drafted by the Buffalo Bills, where Joe Shane was. So I'm so sure Joe Shane did so much work on Gregory, Gregory Rousseau, sure. such a long guy. Giants needed edge back then. So that there's an obvious connection there. I also think Greg Newsom out of Northwestern, who's now on the Browns, Eric Stokes, who's with the Green Bay Packers, he's playing well. If the Giants wanted to go cornerback, those are both man cover guys who could have had success. I'm trying to pull up more names right now. I think that, those that are the good sense. picks right there. I think it would have been Newsom or or uh, then, Stokes. probably knew some honestly one more connection wink martindale who you know he should be factored into this as well adaf aoa was drafted at the end of that draft True. and he didn't have any stats remember he didn't have sacks in college during that mm -hmm. final season i think he did during his his previous season but you can watch his tape and you can see his athletic movement skills and know that there's a lot to grow for him so i think he's another name that should be kind of thrown in that because remember giants didn't have thibodeau like you said and at that point they didn't have azizo jolari either so edge would have been a really really big priority great point um and i, I i'll just say this from the tape we watched earlier the, that game i wasn't too impressed with oa personally now now he's early in his career and he's only going to get better you hope like as he learns the position i've but seen I good oa tape though that's the yeah. thing like this flash like, yeah is... you you're right. Like against the Giants, he wasn't like a home record or anything like that. Yeah. He had like two impact plays that like kind of jumped out on film. But other than that, you didn't really see him all that much. Like watching him and then watching Kayvon, like it's much more obvious to me that Kayvon Thibodeau is 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 kind of really raising his game in high leverage situations, whereas Adafi Owe, not as much, at least against the Giants. I'm sure in other games he's doing yeah. so. Yeah, it's hard to know when we don't see all the tape. Matt, Matt Messelberg asks, should we be having flashbacks to when Ben McAdoo was the coach and we all thought he was the head coach of the future? What makes Brian Dable so different? He prefaces that he's loving Dave, or he, he said, I'm loving Dable, but I'm having some bad flashbacks of oversized diner menus in McAdoo's hand on the sideline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, we all have those flashbacks. I would say it's the adjustments in game, which can be credited to Dable and it can be accredited to Mike Kafka as well. You didn't see as many adjustments with Ben McAdoo. And I wasn't covering the team professionally, but I watched the Giants and I'm a diehard Giant fan. It seemed like the offense was relatively stagnant and it was to the identity of just being a little bit more of a West Coast type of offense. A lot of just, I'm going to trust this one-on-one -on -one matchup and hopefully my guy is better than yours. And guess what? Giants had Odell Beckham at that time and he was better than a lot of the league. So that's one reason why the offense was, I feel like a little bit more prolific than, than uh, maybe it actually was in terms of like the coaching part of it. So that's, I think the difference for me is you see the in-game adjustments, which is such a huge part of coaching. Yeah, I think for me, there's two main components to this as why as why you should be excited about Dable, but not excited about McAdoo. The first component of this would be what Nick said. McAdoo's offense wasn't interesting. It wasn't unique. It wasn't changing week to week based on, based on the opponent, just as it hasn't in Carolina in the second stint here. It was that same offense, the slants, flats, the win your one on one matchups, no pre-snap motion, same personnel grouping. And the Giants were winning with one big play from Odell Beckham a game, it seemed like and just phenomenal defense. And that leads me to my second point of why you should be more excited. Brian Dable in year one is working with 7-4 offsuit to bring a poker reference back in. I haven't brought this to a while. And Ben McAdoo had like pocket tens, solid hand, because Ben McAdoo had an elite defense from a talent standpoint that season. Vernon was playing out of control. Uh, Damian Harrison had an unbelievable season that year. Landon Collins should have been defensive player of the year. He was playing so well that year. Janoris Jenkins playing phenomenal football on the outside. And there were other players that made that defense pretty good too. So with that said, he's working with a lot less of a talent. I mean, look at this year. Brian Dable's first year as head coach. The Giants only have 65% of their cap space even being used. Again, I pointed this out yesterday. I'll point. I'll keep pointing this out because it's just so insane to me. 35% of the cap that you're allowed to work with the NFL team this year, the Giants aren't using right now. And that could change if Galladay gets back on the field. But that's a combination of Galladay and then all their dead cap. They have almost 50 million in dead cap of just bad contracts that are still toiling away. And even though they're not on the roster, these players, you still have to pay them against the cap. So Ben McAdoo had a lot more to work with from a talent standpoint. That's the that's to me is honestly the biggest difference. Yeah, I think that was well put. And 
you can just see it, like we said, in game. I think that's the the one thing that really jumps out to me. And we've ushered so much praise throughout the year of what Kafka and Dable have been able to do. Now we have a question from Alex Zonic. He asks, arguably, Kadarius Tony trade value was higher in the offseason after he actually played in games. Is this just a setup trade at the deadline? Or because uh, I can't make sense of it otherwise, is what he says. That's a great, great point. Alex, like theoretically speaking, the Giants could have got more more for Kadarius Tony if they traded him at any point in the offseason. I completely agree with that. I think anyone who denies that is being a homer, to be completely honest. There's no way you're telling me if you tried to trade Tony in the offseason, you wouldn't have gotten more than this crappy third, which is really a fourth, and a sixth, which is nothing, really. I mean, it's a dart throw, great. We get another dart throw. But you get a dart throw on like a McKeithen type. That's what you can get around that late sixth range. It's not much at all. I mean, some people would even argue they'd rather, you're going to get like the level of a UDFA there and just just get get to take them a little earlier. The late three, it's worth something. Hopefully, they can turn it into something. It's not much. Um, and so, look, you would have got more then, but I think the problem here, Alex, is they tried to make it work with Tony. They understood that there's still so much upside if they could get it right with this kid. And even after he didn't show up for the early voluntary OTAs, he then came in for the back end of those voluntary OTAs. All right, he's giving us an all, you know, he's lending out an olive branch. He's saying, okay, I will work for it. And then, as we saw early in the season, he didn't like his role because he was only playing a certain amount of snaps because the Giants didn't feel comfortable with him from a mental standpoint. Then he got injured. And so they couldn't have predicted all these things that would have happened. And at the time, I think they found more upside to keeping Tony, seeing if it works rather than trading him for like a late second, which they maybe could have got or a mid third or an earlier th type of third, which you might not even have gotten or a three and a four or three and a five. There wasn't really too much. I don't think there was, they lost too much by not trading him in the off season. I don't think anyone was really giving there were no one was giving a one for him. Obviously. I don't think anyone was really giving a two, but maybe they could have got a two, but I doubt it. So you only ultimately end up only losing like, I don't know, maybe like 35 picks or 30 ish picks. I would say on that first pick, they got the three and then maybe you would have lost an extra four. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. And I think you're, yeah. you're spot on with that, Dan. I got to say though, man, I was thinking about this this morning, like just because people are like, yo, it's, it's great that the Giants trade this. And I'm like, yeah, like, like we broke down the Kadarius Tony trade podcast, like there's pros and there's cons. It's like, if you were to go out and buy a house for $600,000 and then a year later you sell that house for half that, that's not a net positive, but say that that house had crappy piping and it was an absolute <laughs> mess and it wasn't worth your time. You're just going to take what you can get for it. That's the exact analogy for Kadarius Tony. Yeah, that's it. And then look, it's, and you know, some people have said he's not on the field. He's not playing at all. Well, if you could guarantee me Kadaris Tony will not play another NFL game, then I could buy into your argument that this is such a great steal for the Giants to get a three and a six for this type of player. But I just don't think that's going to be the case. I think he will play some NFL games moving forward. Uh, a lot of those will be on our cheap rookie deal, too. So it is what it is, but not on Shane again, no, not on no. the GM at all. This is on the prior regime. And this is on not just the prior regime. I'll say it, Nick. This is on him. This is on the kid, dude. Oh, of course. This is on yeah. Darius Tony himself. He couldn't find a way to make it work on a six and one team. Come on, dude. Even Kenny Galladay, who was, was wasn't playing over David Sills. You know, but do you know how embarrassing and frustrating and like appalling that must have been for Galladay to have to stand on that sideline and watch David Sills out there? Like, no offense to David Sills, but in earned that spot over in, in Dable's mind, and I'm sure he did. But you don't see Gary's, you don't see them needing to trade. Not that anyone would want to trade for Galladay, but you don't need to, you don't see it being the same scenario there. So this is also on Tony too, man. He, he couldn't find a way to make it work. And that's, that's his fault. But also like, how the hell do you draft a player like this in the first round? Like, just what are you doing? Like, and we didn't know this at the time. So I'm not trying to bash. I'm not trying to say we were right. We said not to do it or whatever. But it's just like, you need to like, if a kid's like this, how is that not vetted pre-draft? Like how the F? Like you had, what did they say? They liked his combine interview. They thought he was like bubbly. They had a late and night interview with him. And he had, yeah. yeah. Late night senior bowl interview with him. And in spite of being late at night, he had such a bubbly personality. Like that's what you're using to decide this type of thing. It's such like an old man evaluation of it. Oh, right. He was good at night. So that means he's great. Yeah. The thing is like, there were the red flags that we talked about, but I remember talking about it on the podcast. Like, yeah, there are red flags and we were trying to excuse it. And we kind of had blind faith that yeah. Gettleman and judge really vetted him. We had blind faith in that and we were wrong. And that's fine. Just because it didn't make any sense that they would make the mistake again after Deandre Baker. That's why it's so freaking frustrating. And it's just another 
shot at that former regime, not to sit here and take shots, but they're very warranted. And it's still affecting this current team and this current regime, which speaks to the job that Joe Shane is actually doing. Yeah, 100 percent. Because, again, there's no doubt about it. I know you guys are saying he wasn't on the field. I get it. But they could really benefit from a player like Darius Tony being inserted back into the offense. They don't have that option now, and it's fine. They had to get what they could get, but that's still the fact. Uh, anyway, that's all for the mailbag today. Thank you so much for tuning into the Big Blue Bander podcast. Hopefully, this was a good week of content for all of you guys. We had a lot of fun doing the two film breakdowns, those lengthy breakdowns. Check them out on YouTube if you want to watch the All-22. And not a lot of people have reached out lately and been like, I love you guys because I don't have access to All-22. Now I get to watch it all. That's true. If you guys are new to the show, check out the All-22 pods because you'll get to watch the film of the Giants. It might be your only access to it. Um, and so hopefully we can add a little with our analysis as well. Then you also have the preview podcast with Danny Kelly, The Ringer. You have this mailbag and the Kadarius Tony trade reaction. So check out all our content. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll talk to you after the game on Sunday.